Welcome back to class. As usual, this class is sponsored by Isaac Humanitarian Foundation. Now, today we shall be looking at systems of government. And of course, under this uh, topic, we have three um, examples. We have the presidential system, the parliamentary system, and of course, monarchy. But for the sake of class, we shall dwell extensively on presidential system of government. You see, I have always established one fact. And that is the fact that for there to be a state, government is inevitable. You cannot have a state without government. And of course, this government, like I always say, can manifest in different forms. Today, our focus is what are the systems of government that we have? The first is uh, the presidential system of government. Now, the word presidential is from the word president. Alright, so meaning a system of government where the political head can be referred to as a president. But then, if you look at this concept critically, what we find is a fusion of powers. Alright, we have what we call the executive power and the ceremonial power. So under a presidential system of government, we have a fusion of power where we have one person having both executive and ceremonial powers. All right, and that person is referred to as a president. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of definition, presidential system of government can simply be said to be a system where executive and ceremonial powers is vested solely on one single individual known as a president. In Nigeria, in the year 1979, Nigeria's first executive president was Shem uh, Shagari, of his late now. He was from the Fulani, he was a Fulani man. Now, in 1979, Sheru Shagari became Nigeria's first executive president, having both executive and ceremonial powers. Alright? And of course, you know, in our political history, alright, there was a point where the military came and you know, hijacked them, hijacked power. But ever since we've returned to democracy in 1999, we have always had a system where one person controls the government, and that person is referred to as the president. In a presidential system, there's also what you refer to as a vice president. The president is the head of the executive, and of course, he delegates functions and responsibilities to his vice. Just like we have in Nigeria today, where our president is Muhammadu Buhari, and of course our vice president is Professor Yemi Sibani. Okay, this is a system where both executive and ceremonial powers are vested on the, on the president. All right, and it's assisted by his vice president. Usually, the president and the vice president are from the same Party, the same political party uh, system. Alright, so you have uh, in Nigeria, the new Sibanjo and of course you have Muhammad Buhari are both members of the All Progressive um, Congress. Alright, now moving forward, let us look at functions of the president all right, as the head of, of government. Now, I, I need to say this. Another definition of the presidential system. Is where one person is both the head of state and head of government. Now, when we talk about head of state, we refer to the president in his ceremonial capacity. When we talk about head of government, we refer to the president in his executive capacity. Alright? So, a president is both the ceremonial head and the political head. So when I have to talk about 
um, head of, 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 um, of state, while executive head, think about the head of government. Now, let us look at the functions of the president as the head of state. In other words, the functions of a president in his ceremonial capacity. Number one function, assent. Assent here, we talk about approval. You see, of course, you were told when you were taught um, the different um, you know, organs of government, you were told that it is the function of the legislature to make laws. All right? Now, before laws are made, the initial stage, so you, to, you call them bills. A bill is simply a proposed law. Now, when a bill has gone through all the stages involved before it can become a law, the final stage, which is actually very important, is the part of assets. This is why we talk about presidential assets, which means the president giving approval for a bill to metamorphose into becoming what? To becoming a law. So the president, while acting in his ceremonial capacity, has the power of presidential assets, which of course simply means giving approval for a bill before it can transform into becoming a law. Number two function of a president in his executive capacity, receiving visitors. Now, I need to say this. A state is a superhuman. The state just like a human being interacts. The state make friends. At the same time, the state can also make enemies. The president acts on behalf of the state. It is the responsibility of the president in his ceremonial functions, in his ceremonial capacity, to receive visitors from all over the world. The president receives visitors on behalf of Nigeria from all over the world. All right, now, when they come to Nigeria, the president receives them on behalf of the good people of his state. So do not forget, the functions of the president in his similar capacity includes, number one, presidential assent. Number two, receiving of international visitors. Now, let us look at another function of the president in his ceremonial capacity. Attending international conferences. International conferences. The president, you know, in his ceremonial capacity, attends conferences on behalf of the state. Now, the word international here, if we look at it, uh, you know, speaking within a narrow framework, we have two words, inter and national, from the word nation. Inter here simply means interaction. Interactions between and among nations. Probably speaking, interactions between and among states. So the president, in his similar capacity, attends international conferences on behalf of the state. Remember I told you, the state is a superhuman and the president acts on behalf of the state. Is that the key? So always remember that in the similar capacity of a president, he has the power of assets, the power to receive visitors on behalf of the state, and of course, to attend international conferences. Number four. Ceremonial with the events. The president attend ceremonial events within the state framework. For instance, Independence Day uh, events, being present at uh, March past. All right, these are some of the events that the president, you know, attends in his ceremonial capacity. Do not forget that a presidential system is simply the fusion, the fusion of powers Talking about where one man, who is referred to as the president, is both the head of state having ceremonial powers and the head of government having executive. Do you understand that? 
So we have looked at some of the functions of the president in his ceremonial capacity. Let us look at the function of the president in his executive capacity. Number one. Drafting of budgets. See, one of the um, features of government, one of the features of government is revenue. It's revenue. We're talking about income. You see, money is necessary for the will of a state to be achieved. Budget is a very important feature of, 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 of government. It's an important aspect of the powers of the president. Budget here talks about the estimated you know, income and expenditure of a state during a period of time, usually one year. We are talking about a projection as to what a state is expected to receive by way of income and also to spend by way of expenditure during a period usually for what for one year. Now the president coordinates the drafting of the national budget in conjunction with the Ministry of Finance and other relevant ministries. So the president acting in his executive capacity has the power to draft budgets. Number two, foreign policy. Foreign policy. I did mention in our previous class that foreign policy talks about the statement, the official statements that guides the behavior of a state in its interaction with state and non-state actors. It is the responsibility of the president to spearhead the formulation of a country's foreign policy in conjunction with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, of course, other relevant ministries and agencies. So, government has that responsibility, and that responsibility is coordinated by the president. The third function of a president in his executive capacity, power of appointment. The president has the power by law to appoint people into different ministries, departments, directorates, and agencies. These are some of the powers that the law accords to the president. He has the power to appoint for himself special advisors and assistants that will help him in, his, in, in carrying out his constitutional responsibilities. All right? So, please don't forget that the president, while acting in his executive capacity, one, drafts, spearheads the drafting of the nation's budget. Two, coordinates the formulation and implementation of the foreign policy of the states. Number three, power of what? Of appointment. Let's look at another function of the president in his executive capacity. Power to declare a state of emergency. The president has the power to declare a state of emergency when there is a breakdown of law and order. When there is a need to have emergency rule, the president, acting in his executive office, can declare a state of emergency. Now, please don't forget this class is not. Um, the end in itself, but rather it's a means to, to an end. So please, I, I encourage that 
you also um, do further reading because what we do here is just to stimulate your your interest. So please not forget, do well to check up this uh, this topic in your relevant uh, reading materials and also um, um, consult um, the internet textbooks for for further uh, further. So the same way I gave you. Um, Four examples of the president acting in his um, ceremonial capacity. I've also given you four examples of the president acting in his executive capacity. Thank you for, let us look at features of a presidential system of government. Features of a presidential system of government. Number one, popular support. In my previous class, when I talked about legitimacy, I, I, I did mention that legitimacy is simply according popular support to the government of the day. Now, for a president to come into power, it is expected that such person, before becoming the president, must have secured, you know, uh, the highest number of vote cast during the electionary period. So simply put, a president is one that has been supported by the people to the ballot to become the elected president. Ladies and gentlemen, one feature of the presidential system of government is popular support to casting of votes. This in itself is um, self-explanatory. Number two feature of the presidential system of government, rule of law. Now, is it, the concept of the rule of law is one that every student of government should know. Do not forget, the rule of law uh, is a system, or is a concept rather, that was made popular by Professor Albert Van Dyson in his book, An Introduction to the Principles of the Laws of the Constitution, in which he said that the rule of law is simply the supremacy of the law over the ruler and the ruled. So in a presidential system of government, it is expected that the president must observe and must uphold the tenets of the rule of law. Talking about the principle of impartiality, talking about the principle of equality, and of course, fundamental human rights. Of course, during the, the, the tenure of um, late Umaru Musa Yadua, he, he, he kept saying that his government would uphold the rule of law. And you see, if you were a state of government and you followed that anymore, you will realize a very large extent that he did keep to his promise. So the rule of law is an important aspect of a presidential system of government which states that everybody is equal before the law. Those in government and those that are being governed are one and the same under the eye of the law. Do not forget that the law is a respecter of no person. Hence, that insignia of the judiciary, where the woman wears the blind spot, goes to exemplify the fact that the law respects no person. We are all the same. The law does not respect status, does not respect creed, does not respect race, does not respect religion. We are all naked before the law. Another feature of the presidential system of government is separation of powers. Separation Powers. Now, separation of powers is a concept that was popularized by the French philosopher Baron de Montesquieu, who wrote a book in French, a spirit of law, of course, in English meaning the spirit of the law. And we talk about powers being clearly separated and defined amongst the three organs of government, we're talking about the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. So ladies and gentlemen, in a presidential system, powers must be, power of government is duly, you know, separated, defined, and regulated by the constitution. Number four feature of a uh, presidential system is impeachment. Impeachment. Now, in this system, in a presidential system, the president is seen as the protector of the constitution. His powers 
are defined and regulated by the constitution. He must not act outside his constitutional powers. If he does that, he is perceived to have acted ultra violence. And the moment a president begins to act in a manner that is not recognized by the constitution, it is possible that such a president can be impeached by the legislature. You see, in a presidential system, there's what you call checks and balances. And of course, this is um, an offshoot of um, the function of, um, of powers. To ensure that one organ of government is not superior to the other, and to also safeguard against Thailand. Now, a president that does not conform to the dictates of the constitution can be impeached. Impeachment is a lawful removal. Now, if notice, I meant I mean of the word lawful because there are other unlawful ways of removing a, you know, an elected president. Of course, the, the, the other end to is what you call coup d'etat, which of course is uh, a tool employed by the military. But then, in a democracy, the president can be removed by impeachment, in which case, where the total majority of the legislature have perceived that the president has acted contrary to the constitution and his removal is necessary for democracy to be preserved. So, ladies and gentlemen, Features of the presentation of government include popular support, rule of law, separation of powers, impeachment. Let's look at uh, some other some other features. Ministers. See, the president is the executive head. He coordinates the government, but then he works with other people that may not necessarily be they have um, they've been elected into office. He has the power to appoint for himself ministers, and in conjunction, in conjunction, they manage the affairs of a state. But let me make this clear to you. In a presidential system, ministers are not members of the parliament. They are not members of the legislature. But in the parliamentary system, we realize that ministers are also members of the parliament. But in the presidential system, ministers are not members of the parliament. Now, let me really explain this. This is asking who are ministers. Now, in this case, I'm not referring to ministers in churches. A minister is the political head of a ministry. A minister is the political head of a ministry. He is appointed by the president and his appointment is ratified by the National Assembly. All right, this office is not elected. A ministers are appointed by the president and that appointment is ratified by the National Assembly. Let me shed more light on this. Now, when an individual is nominated by the president, all right, that list is called the ministerial list, all right. Now, once the list gets to the National Assembly, precisely the Senate, which of course is the upper house or the red chamber, if you may, upon ratification, all right, upon ratification, the successful nominees are referred to as ministers designates. At the point where they are being quizzed by the National Assembly, they do not have an idea as to which ministry they will be posted by the president. So they are referred to as ministers or designates. It is the responsibility of the president to now assign these ministers that can designate to different ministries. And ministers in a presidential system, they are individually responsible to the president. And the next point, of course, is dismissal. Dismissal. The, ladies and gentlemen, the president is constitutionally empowered to dismiss a non-performing minister. 
The president has, I, I, I take tell you that ministers are appointed. They are not elected office holders. They don't have a fixed tenure of office. So they are tied to the tenure of the president if the president decides to keep them for that long. But then it is totally okay for a president to dismiss a minister whenever he decides. For instance, in this country, there was a minister of health whose name I will not mention. She was in office for just six months. After six months, the president felt that she was not performing and he dismissed her. Of course, <laughs> everyone did not fall. The president can act within his power to dismiss a non-performing minister, or better still, to reshuffle his cabinet. A minister can be taken from one portfolio and given another as soon as play out in Nigerian politics, where a minister was taken from one ministry and then, you know, taken to another ministry. That is the president acting within the confines of his presidential powers. And of course, it is a feature of the presidential system of government. I'll take one more before we move to the next subtopic by camera legislature. There are most presidential systems will find a bicameral legislature. Now, when we talk about bicameral, we refer to um, a system where we have two bodies making the law. Now, you, you were told that um, for the organs of government, we have to be organs just so you know, executive, legislature, and judiciary. The legislature is that arm of government that is responsible for lawmaking. And you have, we, we have to touch the legislature. Bicameral legislature and unicameral legislature. We we'll talk about unicameral, we we'll talk about a system where we have just one body making law. For instance, Ghana. In Ghana, we have just one lawmaking body called the Ghanaian National Assembly. Another example, Kenya, Bulgaria, Romania. These are examples of states where they have just one body making law. But then, in the presidential system, like that of uh, Nigeria, at the federal level, we have a bicameral setup where we have two law-making bodies, in which case there is a lower house and an upper house. The lower house in Nigeria is referred to as the Federal House of Representatives, aka the Green Chamber, where the upper house is called the Senate, aka the Red Chamber. Now, collectively speaking, when we refer to them as one element, the lower house and the upper house, they are called the National Assembly. National Assembly is to Nigeria, what the Congress is to the USA. So we're talking about a collective name for the lawmaking bodies in Nigeria at the federal level. We have a bicameral system, of course, a national assembly. This national assembly is an it's, it's an amalgam of the different peoples of Nigeria. They have representatives from different senatorial and uh, you know um, constituencies in different states representing and aggregating the interests of the people. Look at the next topic like, very fast. I did tell you this class is not self exhaustive so please do further with this. We look at advantages. We have it as merits in some textbooks. I'll just take two for sake of time. Number one, fixed tenure of office. Now, this example, you know, helps in uh, ensuring political stability. All right. In the presidential system, the president has, has a fixed tenure of office. In the Nigerian example, a tenure, the life of a tenure is four years. Four years. But then, if an individual or a president can, you know, go for another tenure at the expiration of the previous one, so making it two tenures of eight years. And you cannot go above that. There, there, there was a time in our political history where a particular president, whose name I will not mention, but of course, from Ogun State, this 
president was so in love with power and he wanted to do what the constitution did not recognize, going for a third term. And of course, he sponsored his cronies in the National Assembly to have what he called a constitutional amendment that would recognize a sitting president going for a third term. Of course, that idea was dead on arrival. So many years after, he said comically to the hearing of the world that he never mentioned the idea of third term. So when you look at on the comic page, when you look at the, the Mexican uh, political space, the case of the more you look, the less you see. But then the president in a, in a, in a, in a presidential system has a fixed tenure of office, usually four years, and of course can go for two um, two tenures of eight years. And then there have been whispers, you know, in some parts of this country that we should have a civil tenure of six years. You know, in such a case, a president can only become president just once after which he leaves space for another person. Number two, very fast, advantages of the presidential system, it is democratic. It is democratic. It is democratic. The explanation of the word democratic is from the word democracy. Democracy is from the Greek words demos and kratia meaning people and um, the rule. But then, by way of definition, a system of government where the people can govern themselves directly or indirectly through representatives periodically elected by them. Because a system of government brings to life that which democracy preaches. Very first, disadvantages of presidential system or the merits of presidential system government. Number one, very fast, use of time. It is expensive to operate. Just so you know, Nigeria has the most expensive democracy in the world. It's expensive to operate. You will find that a president, having so many aides and assistants, those assistants also have assistants. And those, as, those assistant assistants also have assistants. A large chunk of Nigeria's budget is spent on overhead costs. And when you, a country that spends a lot on overhead costs as against capital expenditure, capital projects, is bound to progress at the, at the speed of its name. And that is the situation we have found ourselves as a country. Just recently, the president met the vice president of the so government, he said Nigeria's government is expensive to operate. And that is the truth. The presidency of government is very, very expensive. And this is an argument that is not in favor of this system. And number two, the merits, too much emphasis on protocol or bureaucracy. Decision making in the system of government is very slow. And that's because it has, uh, before it's can be reached, it must pass through different tables, uh, different government offices, different agencies to have different inputs. The government or the, the president must be, you know, fully advised before taking a particular decision, and this does not help in fast decision making, in a case where issues need to be attended to in good time. So one main disadvantage of the presence of government is bureaucratic bottleneck. It slows down the pace and the growth of the state, and of course, the decision making process of the government. Thank you very much, I hope you enjoyed this class. Do not forget, this class is courtesy, Isaac, my dear foundation, thank you. Good night.